gonna trust him more, yes. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, save your friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how Trust him, how I built him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Trust him more. Thank you. Please be seated. Good singing. <coughs> well, if you're a baby boomer, this is one that we really like the tune to. If you're not, you should like it anyway. <laughs> We've done it a few times. It's, uh, it's the tune to the Mama and Papa song of California Dreaming. So if you like the music, you want to sing it. So we've changed the words to Thank You, Precious Jesus. And I think it tells a good story about Jesus' ministry as we as we work our way through the story during Lent. Now we're gonna feature Susan and Laurie on this one. next song is, uh, I like it a lot, it's one of my favorites, and one day Joel Hogan came up and said, do you ever do Wonderful Grace of Jesus? So I mentioned it to the group, and they said, yeah, we do that. So I said, okay. So hopefully you've sung it before, and we're going to do it a cappella. What does that mean? <laughs> Without any help. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> One 
wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall this praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. today for your, for your grace, for the matchless grace that you give us. Lord, we thank you for your precious Son, Jesus Christ. It is so sweet that we can trust in his forgiveness of our sins through his blood. Lord, we ask you to look favorably on our church today as we come to worship you and to lift your name on high. Lord, help each one of us to grow in our faith, to grow in our discipleship to know what it means to be a witness for you. Lord, we know that we need to come here and gather strength together. But Lord, we also know there are those out there that are looking for something. Those who are looking for you. Those who will be the leaders of this church. Lord, help us to invite them in. Help us to reach out. Help us to witness. Lord, there are those in our midst today who are still suffering from the loss of a loved one. There are those who are dealing with the uh, stress of health concerns. Lord, there are those who have relationship issues that need your help, need your love, need your comfort. Lord, we ask that you be with each one. We lift them up to you. We know that in your hands they will be taken care of. Lord, we ask that you just be with each one here today and guide us through this worship service. Open our hearts to your word. I know when our pastor 
that she will teach us and she will have us to do. We do want to welcome each of you to the service today, and if you'll register your attendance, please, on the pads at the end of each pew. There are a number of upcoming meetings in preparation for the April 12th council meeting. The out outreach team will meet tomorrow, March 16th at 6 p.m., and the nurture team will meet Tuesday, April the 7th at 7 p.m and the members of those are listed in your bulletin. As I said, the council will be meeting on April the 12th. Next Saturday, there will be a grief support group meeting. And then next Sunday, we will have the baby tea for Kevin and Ashley Byram. So please plan to attend those activities. On March the 29th, we'll have a meal and the proceeds of that will go to the Rockathon to support the McCoy program. And then following that meal, there will be a meeting of the staff parish committee. And the staff themselves are also encouraged to attend that meeting. As we go through this week, please continue to pray for the Paul Teat family and the family of Johnny Parker. Also remember Annette Thunderberg, who's been quite ill this week. Faye Robinson, who's been in the hospital this week. Susie's mother, Mrs. Kennedy, has fallen and she is injured and at Susie's house, so remember them. And continue to remember those who are, are in ongoing treatment, Wayne Street, Donnie Halsey, and Fred Lee. On a positive note, I see Robin Wheeler's back with us today, and we're glad to see her. And Myra Altman has a, survived a big birthday this week, so congratulations to her. This time, we'll have our prelude. Now if our children will come for Children's Minute. Good morning. How are you? You want to say good morning to everybody else here? Let's do it loud. Say good morning. Good morning. Good, good. I'd like to let, you, let them know you're here. Today, I brought you guys a picture and a poem. There you go. William, you want that one? 
Susie's going to pass them to you. There you go, Katie. That's what you call mass confusion. I was looking in the computer, just kind of surfing around, and I found this picture of Jesus, and I know it's going to be really hard for you to see, but it is just beautiful. And there was a poem that I wanted the children to hear. And the name of the poem is God Made You. It's God made you special, this I know. He gave you to us to watch. Yes, my darling. What you need, sweetheart? You need a tissue? Okay, hold on just a minute. You need the tissue. Now, who hasn't had a snotty nose this week? <laughs> Is it better, William? Okay. Let's start all over again. God made you special, this I know. He gave to us, he gave you to us to watch you grow. With kiss on the cheek and a hug just for you. And you are our everything, this much is true. God made you special, our little one. I pray you keep your eyes looking up toward the sun. You were created with a purpose in mind. God made you special, one of a kind. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, protect these children. The earth is beautiful, but some people in it are very evil to the bone. When these children go to school and college, Open their eyes and ears and minds to exceed, but open their hearts to receive only your teaching. When they need to stand up for their teaching, cover them with your love. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. Well, maybe you need him. Thank you, Lorraine. And if you'll stand, we will sing close to thee, hymn 407. <laughs>
I, I do want to add to what Jane has said and say, Robin and, and Scott, it's great to see y'all back there. I'm so glad you're feeling better, Robin, and that you're able to be with us today as well as Faye. And uh, we do continue to remember the families in our church who've lost loved ones in this past week. And I would also ask you to pray a special prayer for Freddie and Diane as um, he's going to be going through some upcoming evaluations and, and dealing with uh, the, the process regarding his health. It was so good to see him outdoors <laughs> the other day and, and stop by and talk with he and Diane. And I think he looks, Freddie, you look great <laughs> and you're doing great and we continue to pray for you. I know he's watching us this morning as we as we uh, go through our service. Let us pray together. Most gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for this season of Lent, a time in which we can focus our minds, our hearts, our attention on what you have done for us, your faithfulness to us. Lord, a time for us to reflect on how faithful we have been, how true to you we have been, to allow you to shine your light into our lives, upon our lives, so that uh, the things that need to be rooted out may be done so in a way that leads to healing. You are such a good and gracious, merciful and loving God as you are holy and just. And Lord, for the second chances that you give all of us, we are grateful and thankful. But Lord, as you teach us, and as we, as we hear from you, as we learn from you, help us to continue to move forward, becoming more and more Christ-like in our journey. Lord, as you fill us with your joy, as you help us to overcome things in our lives, as you give us the strength we do not have in our weakness, um, we are thankful as well. Lord, we ask you in this day, we are mindful to ask that you would forgive our sins, known and unknown, that you would continue to cleanse us, that as we meet together, as we pray together, as we study and serve together, that you will knit us closely, that you will prepare us for the open door of ministry that you place before us. Lord, we lift up to you all those today who are lost and without hope. And Lord, may it be so that as we become aware of those persons, that we would reach out with all you have shown us and all that you have made us, all that you have brought us through so that someone else might come to know the precious relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, for those who are ill in this day, give them hope, give them strength. Um, Lord, I lift up to you this morning, Donna, who continues to try to recover from respiratory illness. I know she has so much on her mind and heart that she wants to do for you. And we pray that in these quiet times that she might hear your voice and, and, uh, and Lord, be attentive to you. Lord, you have given us the prayer that we should pray in our lives. You have modeled it for us. You have taught it to us. And now this morning together we pray it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. And if you will please stand as you are able for the reading of the scripture, which is from the book of Revelations, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. A message to Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power and yet you have kept my words and have not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but are lying. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word of patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and you will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, that comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, you may be seated. This morning we continue our look at the seven churches in Revelations, Jesus' letters that were written to them. And I think it's an appropriate series to be in as we are in a season of Lent. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Cool Runnings about the Jamaican bobsled team. Have any of you seen it? Did you see it? Um, It's loosely, okay, loosely I say, based on that first Jamaican bobsled team that competed in the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary. And it's kind of a lighthearted look at a journey from the sands of Jamaica to the snow of Calgary, okay? It's about an improbable, some thought impossible, quest to medal. With an unlikely disqualified former Olympian for a coach, now I'm talking about the movie, and an inexperienced team hailing from an unlikely country, right? Jamaica? How do you train a team to compete with the best? Those who would have have the best equipment, the best training venues, the best coaches, the best gear, and definitely the greater resources. Well, in hot terrain, in a bathtub, in a push cart, of course, right? For me, that sounds like a line from a Dr. Seuss book. In a hot terrain, in a bathtub, in a push cart, there's even one scene of Sanka uh, inside of a um, ice cream truck and uh, his locks are frozen and he sticks his head out and one of the locks just breaks off. Cool Runnings is a story of succeeding against all the odds. But here's the part that I love about the story in the movie. When they are ridiculed, when they are made fun of, when they are laughed at, they persevered. They wanted to be Olympians more than anything. They wanted to make their country proud. And they continued to train upon their arrival in those actual conditions that they would be expected to compete in. And you know, there was that moment when they wanted to quit. It was like, oh my gosh, what have we done? They took flack off of their fellow competitors and to the amazement of many, they qualified to compete only to experience a disastrous run. And yet, persevering was about winning in the sense that even though they lost the chance at a medal, they won the respect of their fellow competitors, 
the fans who were there that day, the sport commentators, the Olympic community, their country and their families. They persevered crossing the finish line. In the movie, we see them carrying the bobsled on their shoulders across that finish line. In reality, the team may have walked alongside the bobsled, they may have pushed their bobsled to the finish line, but they made it to the finish line and they finished well. And you say, well, Bridget, how could you say they finished well? They didn't get a medal. They just about killed themselves. But it's a story about finishing well, and I love it, love it, love it. I love comeback stories. Finishing well is all about brothers and sisters persevering. In the story about this first Jamaican bobsled team, in the story of being the people of God, perseverance is defined as the ability to, to, the ability to keep on keeping on when things look bleak. The ability to complete a task even though it seems impossible. The boldness to do so even though the odds are against you. It's a steadfastness in spite of difficulty, opposition, adversity. And if you want the formal de definition out of Webster's, um, steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Jesus commended the church at Philadelphia for their perseverance. And he encouraged them in that letter to finish well. There is no complaint for this church. Listen to Jesus' words. I know your works. I have set before you an open door. You have kept my word and not denied my name. You have kept my word of patient endurance. And though this church was small in number, it was the youngest of the seven churches, it is a delight to the Lord Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful thought? To think of a body of Christ, the church, being a delight to the one who died for it, for the one who should be, prayerfully is always the head of it, Though they are persecuted for their beliefs, they are per persevering in faith. They are persevering in the name of Jesus. Well, brothers and sisters, I think we too can finish well when we realize that Jesus assigns the work. Jesus opens this letter by sharing who he is. He is the Holy One. He is morally perfect. He is perfect in character. He is sinless. And he is the true one, he tells them, the authentic revelation of the one true God. And Jesus shares what he does. He tells them that he holds the key of David. If you look back to 2 Kings in chapter 18, you see Eliakim, a servant of King Hezekiah who has been given charge of his palace. And he alone could admit people into the presence of the king. And then if you read in the Isaiah prophecies, you read about Eliakim there as well. On that day I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and will clothe him with your robe and bind your sash on him, and I will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. In his letter to the church at Philadelphia, Jesus applies this passage to himself. Jesus has been given full authority over all by the Father. He has all authority in heaven and earth. He directs, he oversees for the Father all of creation until the end of time when he hands it all back to his Father. He has all authority in the redemption of humanity. Only through Jesus and Jesus alone can anyone have true access to God. There's no other name through which we can be saved. 
It doesn't mean that he picks and he chooses who will be saved, but it is only through a relationship with Jesus Christ that we can be saved, placing our faith and our trust in him, believing in his resurrection. He is the way. He is the open door. And just as Hezekiah gave authority to Eliakim as to who came into the presence of the king, so has the Father done through Jesus. He has all authority, brothers and sisters, over his church. He will open the doors to ministry and service for his church. It is through a connection with Chaplain Gavin from Discovery Club that our church has made a connection with a resident at the old Cottage Hill nursing home. And this connection, this open door is birthing a new ministry. I was telling Bill this morning, we have all kinds of ideas about how God might connect us with the community through the Discovery Club, but I don't think this was one of them. See how cool God is? You see how awesome he is? He will open the doors to ministry and service for his church. The Lord opened the door for a small church like Philadelphia, who in faith and with little power, in some translations it says with little strength, was persevering in the work that the Lord had assigned them. You have kept my word, Jesus told them, and you have not denied my name. When Jesus opens the door to ministry and service, no one can shut it. Paul tried to, didn't he? He tried to push through some doors, but they just wouldn't open. And the one that he wanted to open the most did so in God's good timing and according to his will. Brothers and sisters, when we discover and when we employ the spiritual power that is obtained by faith, expecting God to do something in our midst, then we can walk through the open door that he provides. We can respond to our work with glad hearts, even in the face of adversity, even with whatever limitations and all the naysayers, amen? Thanks be to God. We can finish well when we accept that the work requires the task that Jesus has left all of us. It requires perseverance and it requires commitment. The ability to persevere in the work of the Lord is possible when we are deeply rooted, rooted in and committed to his word. His word teaches us the nature of our holy, just, loving, and merciful Father God as revealed in Jesus the Son. His word teaches us what is required by the Most High God. His word teaches us to cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives who fashions us, who fashions our lives to reflect the character of Christ. His word teaches us to value what the Lord values. His word teaches us to dig for deeper truths that lead to greater service and witness in his name. His word teaches us to depend on scripture when confronted when evil. His word teaches us how to move through this world in such a way that we continue to honor him and glorify him. You know, fulfilling the work of the Lord is a great adventure. It is a wonderful adventure. And like most great adventures, it has its highs and its lows. It has its successes and failures. It can be breathtaking and humbling. It can be frightening and treacherous. Then I think of Jesus calming that stormy sea and Peter walking on the water until he lost his focus. And you know what? Jesus was as much with him in those churning waters as he was when Peter walked upon it. Amen? Jesus is present in all aspects of fulfilling the work we are called to do. 
Do not be afraid. How many times have we seen that in Scripture? Do not be afraid. Lo, I am with you. We can persevere and we can stay the course, whether the seas of life or ministry or service, whether those waters are choppy or they are smooth. The New Testament writers knew the importance of keeping on, keeping on. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. You can go to Romans 5.3 and Ephesians 6.18 and 2 Timothy 3.10 and 2 Peter 1.6. The importance of keeping on in the face of whatever. This church in Philadelphia was little, but it remained committed to the work of Christ. And Jesus said, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, we can finish well when we count the costs, but when we also count the rewards, rewards that are out of this world, they're not on this earth. The Christian life is not easy and the demands are high. There's a reason Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Those are not just pretty words that we, that we say during the season of Lent and Easter. We are called to live holy lives. In doing so, we may find ourselves at odds with those who remain, who choose to remain in darkness. In doing so, in trying to live those holy lives, we may find ourselves the objects of sarcasm and ridicule and contempt. Why not? Jesus was. We are called to live holy lives and and in doing so, we may find ourselves up, up against the, as the scriptures say, the powers and the principalities of Satan's kingdom. We are called to live holy lives and in doing so, we can expect adversity and obstacles there is a reason that Jesus calls us to count the cost of following him before we commit ourselves to his work if we understand the cost of achieving a greater good in the name of Jesus then we can persevere we can overcome we can overcome the temptation to give up on the world divorcing ourselves from it we can overcome the temptation to quit to forfeit our spiritual heritage for the flesh, we can be conquerors. We can persevere. We can overcome. We can be conquerors if we're willing to accept the cost. And that cost, remember, is not without rewards. Consider the promises of Jesus in this text. The church will not undergo a time of tribulation. And many scholars disagree with this, saying that Christianity never promises deliverance from suffering. And we understand that we will not be spared from suffering now. But maybe at some time in the future, Jesus says, I will keep you from the trial. That's what he tells the church at Philadelphia. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 10 is saying that if we hang on to our faith, if we persevere for the Lord, if we keep his word and don't deny him, we will be removed before the hour of trial and testing to come upon the world. Jesus tells us of this time in the gospel, saying some will be taken and some will be left behind, dependent upon our walk with Jesus. He also says, if you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of the Lord. You will always be in the Lord's presence. I will write on you the name of my God. Commentary says that the church at Philadelphia would have really gotten that because the name of their city had changed, I think, two times in their past. But here Jesus is telling them about, I will write the name of my God on you. 
your identity will be wrapped up in the identity of God. And at that point, nothing can take you from the Lord. Not Satan, not ourselves. And we will realize the promise of spending eternity with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I am telling you, expect it. Expect it. Times may come when you want to give up. You may want to give up on living a holy life. You may want to give up on planting the seeds of faith. You may want to give up on inviting others to come to Jesus. You may want to give up on helping others discover the fellowship in the church that you have found, that sustains you, that grows you. You may want to give up on witnessing. Boy, Satan would love it. He'd do a happy dance. But don't do it. Because a, real, a reward awaits all of us. Perfect, complete closeness to the Lord like we have not yet experienced or encountered. An eternity in the presence of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. James Packer says, The Christian's reward is not directly earned. It is not a payment proportionate to services rendered. It is a Father's gift of generous grace to his children far exceeding anything they deserved. Also, we must understand that the promised reward is not something of a different nature tacked on to the activity being rewarded. It is rather the activity itself, communion with God in worship and service, in its consummation. In its consummation. In the movie that I was speaking of, in the movie... Cool Runnings, there's a scene in which the coach and the team leader, the driver of the bobsled, are having a conversation. And the leader of the team says, how will I know if I am enough? That just gives me chills from the top all the way down to my feet. How will I know if I am enough? And it's a movie, okay, but hey, it preaches. And his coach responds. He laughs. He says, when you cross that finish line, you'll know. You'll know. Jesus says to the church at Philadelphia and to us, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Salvation is secure, but don't lose the place of greater service and ministry to the holy, one and true God. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Lord, you are incredibly awesome. I don't care if the word's outdated or not. You are incredibly awesome. You are perfect in your understanding of us. You are perfect in leading us and teaching us. Lord, we should be so grateful that you are available to us to steer us through this world. And, and while we're having the journey and while we're having the adventure to steer us out of harm's way, to steer us on the right path, to keep us moving, to keep us growing, to keep us going, Lord, let us not fail you. We who have little power, Lord, give us more power so that we might do more fully the things that you ask of us. Lord, I thank you for whatever open door you place before this congregation, for this church. May we see it and may we be prepared and ready to walk through it by your grace and in your strength. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most loving Lord, receive these, our tithes and offerings, our gifts. And receive, Lord, also our very selves. 
as we submit ourselves to you and our resources to you. Help us to help you to be known in our community. Help us to grow in our understanding of you in our lives so that we may shine for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together in the hymn, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord.
Brothers and sisters, how shall we know if we are enough? We will know when we cross the finish line. Recovering from the tornado and the open door that presented itself to be in ministry to a community, we were learning that we're enough. Paul in his ending journey of life was asking the same kind of question how will I know if I'm enough Lord give me courage Lord give me strength he wanted courage and strength for that transition in his life those who are among us who are not well who are dealing with health issues and who are finding that they are enough in the sense of not just talking the talk, but walking. I, I celebrate you. I thank God for you. Let us, let us each ask that question of the Lord. Let us each, with his grace, in the journey from today through across the finish line, count on him to f help us to finish well. The Lord God loves you. He loves all of us. Go in this day in his name, in your faith that you have in him, and be his light. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.